All right, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hope you can also see the video recording now. And you can also see my screen. So I'm just gonna do a quick little intro and then we're gonna dive into the content. Um, we have Avanti and Becky from Birchbox here, which is really exciting. Um, so you probably already know because you registered for this webinar, but we're talking about breaking into tech and we're talking with two amazing tech leaders at Birchbox today. They're gonna share lots of tips and secrets and their stories, but really the main event of this discussion is answering your questions live and talking about how you can be more successful in pursuing your future tech career or maybe your current tech career. So throughout the presentation, definitely don't hesitate to continue asking questions in the question panel. We'll be trying to answer some of them in real time and we're also gonna be answering them live um, until two o'clock Eastern. So lots of great time to answer or questions. Also, you can tweet us at Flatiron School and at Birchbox throughout with your questions and comments and favorite moments. Um, so just a little bit of an agenda to know what's coming. We're going to do an intro and a welcome, um, a little bit more about Flatiron School and Birchbox and our Women Take Tech initiative, which you probably um, heard about if you um, are on the Flatiron School or the Birchbox email list. Um, Becky and Avantika are going to tell us a bit about their journey, and then we're going to do a couple tips for breaking into tech and lots of um, Q&A time, as I mentioned. Okay, so really quickly about Flatiron School, if you're not familiar, we've been around since 2012 and we've been helping um, thousands of students grow into careers they love um, and, you know, getting into programming. Uh, we, we recently um, are we're about to launch a jobs report um, talking about all of our um, student outcomes, which is really exciting from the last year. Um, and a really, really big priority for us is increasing access to women um, in programming, uh, which is why we're so thrilled about our partnership with Birchbox. Um, sort of speaking of that, um, our Women Take Tech Scholarship, which is currently live, um, this month Flatiron School and Birchbox have come together to offer, offer $100,000 in scholarships to 25 um, future female developers. If you haven't had a chance to check that out or apply, it's still open at womentaketech.com. Um, and these are scholarships to Flatiron School's online program. So if you have questions about that, definitely go ahead and ask and check out that webpage. And then just for a little bit more color on what that program entails, it's a full stack web development program. So um, full stack Ruby, full stack JavaScript, um, you'll really learn all the skills you need to become hireable as a junior web developer, um, in addition to lots of career, um, career prep and career coaching and help to become really a no brainer hire as you approach your job search. Um, and just a little bit about the learning, um, the learning style, it's self-paced and online, lots of uh, community features and collaboration with instruct instructors, and the ability um, to, get, to get help as you need it, um, almost 24 seven, which is awesome. Okay, so enough about Flatiron School, <laughs> enough about the scholarship, um, let's dive into the main event. I'm gonna scooch out of here. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Becky Case. I'm a director of engineering for Core Platform and International. So what that means is I spend my days helping my team, mostly backend engineers, figure out what software applications we want to run from supporting our payment platforms to how our subscriptions are fulfilled to you know even how we design algorithms and implement which personalized boxes we want to give to our customers each month. Um, what I would say, like my start of how I got into tech is, is very non-traditional. I started as a voice major in college and then I decided it just wasn't for me. I wasn't mentally stimulated. I was unsure that I was going to be able to make it on Broadway, which is what I wanted to do since I was like four. And so I randomly, just out of fun, decided I wanted to take a computer class. And the only thing open was an intro into Visual Basic. And I just decided to take it. Um, my friends thought that was really crazy, but I just went ahead and did it. And I fell in love with it. My, I had the fortunate, I was very fortunate to be, um, the teacher was a woman, so that was really interesting. Most of my professors for the rest of my time at school were not women, but she really encouraged me and she was like, you should do this, you're incredibly great at it, you have the highest grade in the class. For someone who's coming from you know, a non-technical background, I didn't know what a floppy disk was, I wasn't sure how to, what SSH meant, like I basically started completely from scratch my sophomore year in college. Um, and I just fell in love with it. And so that's kind of how I got into tech and I changed my major to computer science. And then the rest is history, basically. I got a job out of school, I worked for zappos.com, and then I decided to move to New York 
worked at a couple of startups before coming to Birchbox and just really found my my place. I love working here, so it's been pretty great. Um, things I'm working on right now is designing our long-term architecture and our infrastructure vision. So like most startups, we have our, our current architecture and it's stuff that you build when you need to get your product out the door. It's basically getting your company started. And then over time, you start adding new pieces of technology in to make it better. And one of the ways to make sure that your new technology that you're adding is helpful and not going to hurt you three years from now is to make sure that you have a long-term roadmap and a vision of where your company is going. And so that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment is just sitting down and designing long-term applications and what's going to happen there. Yeah. Novantika, do you want to go next? Of course. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Avantika. I'm a product manager at Bridgebox. Um, so what that means is that I'm accountable for end-to-end -end product development and features at Birchbox. So working with design to get designs done for new ideas that we have, working with Becky's team in engineering to translate those into technical requirements, launching the features, and then measuring how they're doing. Um, so most recently, I've been owning the mobile apps. So that's our iOS and Android apps for Birchbox. And then the last few months, we've been working on a really new and exciting gift flow on our website, um, which is fully optimized for mobile, which is something else that we're really excited about. Um, so similar to Becky, my path to product management was a little bit non-traditional as well. I started out as a dual degree student in college studying both business and computer science engineering, which is a mixture of skills that actually lends itself really nicely to a PM role. Um, but then I actually started out as a consultant at a management consulting company. Um, so did a lot of strategy consulting, management consulting, very analytical work, uh, moved to, to Google actually, so started to move into tech um, in a more data science and analytics capacity. Uh, but ultimately realized that I wanted to really be involved from start to finish at building products, seeing how they're doing, measuring them. So I didn't want to focus squarely on analytics or squarely on the strategy piece, really putting those things together and, and building cool products. And Birchbox has been a great place to do that. Well, little bit about my story. <laughs> Yeah, so we wanted to take a few moments just to tell you a little bit more about tech at Birchbox. So we have seven different sub teams in tech. So that's quite a lot. Most people don't realize that working in tech means generally being somewhat specialized. So these are the seven specialties that we have at Birchbox. So we have data engineering. Um, that is basically overseeing your data, how it's packaged, <coughs> doing reporting tools, using what's a, a, da a data warehouse. So if you don't know what that is, it's a large application that you can run and oversee huge amounts of data and package it into reporting and different views so that you can um, give basically insights and financials and metrics to the company so that the non-technical users can get data out of. They don't have to run like database queries or anything. It's very easy to use for them. And then we have tech ops. So that is considered like sysadmins. They build and manage our systems infrastructure. They handle our load balancers. They scale our all of our applications, they build and monitor what's going on, they add new servers, they do all of the work that makes our jobs easier. So anything that we need, they have to, they help us deliver. And then do you want to talk about PM? Sure. Yeah. Um, so spoke about this a little bit already, but product management, essentially, we um, build product roadmaps. So starting out really high level, what do we want to accomplish for the year for our website, our apps, um, our backend systems, like any big product, product initiatives. Um, kind of, we work with external stakeholders like marketing, finance, um, data, engineering, just make sure those are feasible, those are prioritized, and then ultimately translate those into specifications and requirements for those features. And it doesn't stop there. So we, we launch the features. We also have to be constantly looking at those, see how they're doing, look at opportunities to optimize them or improve them. Um, so it really is like driving these product development initiatives forward. Um, I can I can scoot down and talk about product design because that's a little bit similar to product management too. Um, so we work really closely with our product design team. Um, they partner with us on, you know, everything from designs, user experience, and user research. So if we know we want to build a new product or a feature, we would come to them, partner up really closely on understanding what the customer need is, um, what the best flow would look like. We even sometimes go into our stores and test it out with actual users to see how it's how it's how it's doing, how it's performing before we even start development, um, and then ultimately um, come up with fully fleshed out visual designs that we can then translate to actual products that you guys can use. Can you talk about front end? Sure. Um, yeah. So that's kind of. Um, 
one of our engineering teams, front end engineering, they work on building our client side client client side experiences. So um, what that means is our website, whether that's on desktop or mobile, our iOS apps, our Android apps. So if you think about any kind of way that you're interacting with Birchbox on a technology platform, you're looking at the front end client that that we built. So um, I talked about the gift flow. That's an example of like a new front end experience that that we could build on our mobile website that we want to uh, put in front of users. So it's really it's really the face of the company on our websites and our apps. Yeah. And then my team primarily focuses on backend engineering. And so that's Ruby is a backend engineering language. It's the languages and servers and that run on the backend web servers that we have for our website. So the front end engineering team requires us to do our job and then we depend on data engineering and tech ops to do their job. So it's all like kind of a hierarchy of how all the different internal teams work together. And then we have data science. So they're responsible for our algorithms and like our data models and all of the analysis. So data science is key to Birchbox's success. We believe in having a very personalized shopping experience for our customers. Our aim is to make it as easy to use and as personalized as possible for each one of our subscribers. So data science is really where we like to invest a lot of our time into it. And data science has to work very closely with the rest of the teams just to make sure that we're delivering on our promise to our subscribers. So that's kind of overview of tech at Birchbox. And then these are the tips that Avantika and I came up with for having a career in tech. Um, the first one I think is just like finding strong mentors. I think both of us over the years have had numerous mentors at various stages throughout our career and just like who believed in us, who pushed us to go forward, who were just, you know, you need to do this, Becky, or this is how I would do it, or, you know, even suggesting that we try out for something that we didn't think we were good enough for. Yeah, yeah. I think the one thing I would add there is just, like, these, these strong people who are champions for you and they could really, like, help you when you're at the at, at crossroads within your career and you're not sure what to do. Also, thinking about role models. So I remember when I worked at Google, there were so many really strong female leaders at, at the C-level and the VP level that, that really helps you um, see what a career path could look like and, and keeps you motivated to keep keep stay in tech and continue working and knowing that there's advancement opportunities. Um, doesn't have to be a woman, but I think it's always nice to feel like there are role models that you can emulate, like Absolutely. look up to and be inspired by. Yeah. At. And I think Avantika and I were also very fortunate. Our first CTO, she just left a few Amazing. months ago. Yeah. She was a woman as well. And she mentored both of us for many years working yeah. here. And definitely she's the reason where I am today. Yeah. One of them. So, yeah. And then that I think segues to our point number two, like don't be intimidated to be the only woman in the room it's likely to happen. Yes. Um, there were many classes when I was in school where I was the only yes. girl and I basically made that my challenge to have the highest grade in all of those classes. So yeah. that was always fun. But there will be companies that you work at where you are the only woman and just so long as it's a good work environment, like it should be fine and, you know, be proud. Like yeah. you're, you're an amazing woman and you're, you're killing it in tech. Yeah. Definitely. Um, the next one, ask for what you want, sounds generic, but I think a lot of women <laughs> overlook this one, especially when you're thinking about career advancement, you're thinking about promotions. Um, know that know that you've, you're here for a reason. You should always know your strengths and what you're doing well. And if you feel like you deserve a promotion or you're ready for the next step in your career, don't be afraid to ask. I think, um, general, not to generalize, but we often wait for people to come to us and tell us, like, I think you're ready for this. I think you should go up for this opportunity. But um, don't be afraid to be ambitious. If you think this is something you can handle or you want to push yourself, ask for it. And I think I've, I've done that at many points in my career. And the worst that can happen is you're seen as ambitious, which is not a bad <laughs> thing. Um, and the best that can happen is you actually get it. So put yeah. yourself out there. Or, yeah, or more realistically, like your manager will probably say, that's good to know. Yeah. Here are the things that we need to work on with you. And as a good man manager, they'll mentor you to get exactly. to where that place is. Yeah. So it can be a little bit intimidating, but you just do it. It's a little uncomfortable. You you kind of feel like, am I, is this appropriate? Am I like, yeah. am I going to get in trouble? Is there going to be like lash, like lash out from that? But like, no, your manager's used to it. It's just, it's something that you have to do. Just like, you know. Top it up. Yeah. Go for it. Have that conversation. Yeah. Be confident, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then I think, like, don't be afraid to take risk. And this kind of goes with, like, what we were just talking about. Like, there will be times when you are stagnating in your career, you've been in a company for a while, and you're not learning anything. And that's a problem in tech. You need to constantly yeah. be learning. If you're not continuously learning, then your tech skills are getting stale. 
and the you know technology will pass you by. You want to be marketable. So you want to make sure that if you're you're happy but you're not learning, that's probably a reason to to think about like telling your manager, right? Or you know, going and figuring out what you need to do next in your career. And that can be a little bit frightening, but usually it is for the long run, like it's a better idea for you. So yeah, just totally go for agree. it. Um, and the last one, I think Becky and I both agreed, like at the yeah. end of the day, uh, you need to just know your stuff. If you're competent, good at your, good at your job and you're good to your coworkers, you embody the culture that you want to, you want to be in like that, that energy is just, yeah. Women or men, everyone needs to do their stuff and, and, and get it done. So I think don't forget about the essentials of what's, what you need to do in your job, getting it done every day. It'll get you where you want to go. Yeah, because if you're if you're working on a very good team surrounded by people, it's generally not about you being a woman. It's generally that you aren't doing a good job. And I think a lot of people sometimes internalize that. And really, you just need to be honest with yourself and be like, well, why why are my coworkers a little annoyed with me? It's probably because you broke the code or you did something <laughs> wrong. Um, but like at the end of the day, if you're doing a good job, like you're gonna be fine. Like. Just remember that. And if you're not fine because the you know environment you're working in is not great, you know, go back to number four, take a risk, leave. Yeah. Find somewhere else that you fit in. Exactly. Yeah. So now it's time for QA. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so um, first of all, there's still time to apply, um, but for the scholarship. Um, and send some questions over. I think we already have some, right? Yes. All right. Do you want to read one. some questions? Yes, we have a good one to start out with, um, which is, what's the best piece of advice you've received during your career slash journey in tech? And this also, I'll add, comes from um, Lenny, who also let us know she recently received the scholarship, oh, the Women's Week Tech Scholarship. Yay, and congratulations. Congratulations. Says, Thank you for the opportunity. So that's yeah, awesome. so exciting. So, right. Thanks for the, the question. The best piece of advice in my journey in tech. Don't give up. Don't give up. And I don't just mean that from like trying to get the new job or, you know, trying to ask for advice. That also applies to like coding in general. There are a lot of times when something is broken and the person who figures it out and the one who's seen as like the rock star of the team is the person who doesn't give up. It's the person who takes the time that they're not frustrated. They're debugging their code. They're figuring out what's going on and they basically are persistent. So I think that's like the biggest thing. It's like, what's next? Keep focused. Never like, don't give up. Yeah, I think for me, um, this was actually advice from our old CDO, Liz, yeah, yeah. Um, who she had a very unique management style and she was one of those people who was really soft spoken, but at the same time, like really knew what she what she wanted to get done. Thanks, and I think I could relate to that a lot uh, because I'm, I tend to not be seen as very aggressive, and I think her advice was be confident. Confidence doesn't necessarily mean you have to be aggressive or cut people off in conversations or be the loudest person in the room, um, but be prepared, come in confident, like speak your mind, and don't let everyone else in the room intimidate you, and I think you can do that in your own style and still be still be effective. So I think that's really helped me, feeling like I don't need to really change myself to be more of a leader. I can be myself, but also get things done. Great. Yeah, we have another question. Um, you know, what's the, what's the most difficult thing you've experienced in terms of being a woman in tech? And how did you overcome it? Yeah. So I would say I, I worked in an environment where it was not very friendly to women before. And I, just full disclosure, did not do a very good job there. Um, I would like to say that I didn't work, that I worked my hardest everywhere. But I found that if I'm not in a good work environment, for me, I don't work my hardest. And the team I worked with was a little disrespectful towards women. They didn't really like me. I was also the only girl. I've, I've been the only girl at many companies, but this was the only one that was really an issue. And um, I took stock of what was going on. And there was a lot of it that they had problems with me because I had some weaknesses in my technical skill sets. And so that was a really good learning experience for me to like get that, um, get those weaknesses addressed, learn more, become a better engineer. So yes, working there was tough, but it made me a better engineer. And then at the end of the day, I, after I got all the skills that I needed, that like was the really the, kind of the problem, I still looked around and was like, I'm not happy being here, so I'm just going to leave. Um, and then I left and I came to Birchbox and it's been great ever since. So, I mean, it made me a stronger engineer, but it also was a very trying time for me. Um, biggest challenge, I guess for me, um, 
I was a limited, especially coming into this role from a non-product or technical role before this, a little worried about like fitting in with the community and the culture and also um, being respected by the engineers, given that I, I am an engineer, but I hadn't been engineering for a while. So I think um, I was a little intimidated and uh, felt a little bit like, do I really, can I, can I do this? Are they going to really respect me? Do I, do I, can I like confidently go up against an engineer and tell them that like, this is what I think you should be doing. Um, I think it just took time. And honestly, for me, it was a lot of preparation, um, knowing what you're, what you're saying, like, don't be afraid to get technical, especially if you're thinking about a role in product. I think a lot of PMs try to shy away from the technical details and still want to take the lead. But until you really get into the weeds, try to understand the problem, try to speak to an engineer, like, on the same level, um, you're not going to get very far. So yeah. I took a lot of effort to get to know them, get to know what they're working on, spent like sessions looking at the code, understanding all the pieces of it, and then could have very like confident discussions with them about what we think could work and could, wouldn't. But um, yeah, initially I was I was nervous <laughs> being seen as a technical technical enough to be a PM. Cool. Um, this next question um, is a little bit open ended, so I'm excited to see where I'll take it. Um, no. Which is <laughs> which is a uh, <laughs> What what any like pieces of advice for getting your first junior developer role? So maybe around interviewing um, or or any technical competencies or anything there. Yeah, so we can definitely start this. I um, we have interns every year who come in, and we always give them like advice about this. So we're pretty good about this conversation. Perfect. <laughs> uh, the first thing, first and foremost, is mastering the technical interviews. So generally, what happens when you go to an interview process is you're required to code in front of people, um, which can be very nerve wracking. Um, also, you're required to you know get it right, and like they ask you very difficult questions right on the spot, and it can be very intimidating. My advice to you, first and foremost, would be to study. Um, like, even now, like, any time, like, I have switched jobs throughout my career, even, like, I'm no longer a junior anymore, but, like, as a senior engineer, like, you still study. Um, you bone up on all the different data structures, all the different, like, sorting algorithms, because you never know what's going to come up in an interviewing pro like like program questions in the interview. Um, so it could be anything. And like, you might not be doing all of the, you know, the sorting algorithms every day in your day-to-day -day work. You might not be using stacks all the time. Maybe you're using all queue based like events, um, but you're still required to know how to use it in an interview, which is a little bit stressful. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a series of like core competencies that basically most engineering interviews require or they ask you about. And like, almost all questions like tend to be basically around those core competencies. Um, so if you study for a few weeks beforehand, like that will make all the difference in the world. I would also suggest going to several interviews before you go to the one that you really want um, as preparation. So I generally start with a company that I know very little about, but I'm interested in because I don't want to waste their time. You still need to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but like the one that you're like, oh, I really want to work here, get me this interview. That's the one that you want to do after a few others. You definitely don't want to do that one first because you want to get all the kinks out. You want to work out like what you're saying. You want to have like your little, your like two minute elevator pitch speech of like, when like, tell me about yourself. Like you can like rail it off really quickly and, and sound very professional before going to that, that big interview that you want. Yeah. Um, and I obviously can speak this a little less than Becky can because she's interviewed many more developers than I have, but we have been like, they often will bring product and, and other roles into interviews for developers. And I think we also look for things. Technical skills are super important, but don't forget about the basics of like, they're going to ask about leadership, leadership experience, team built, team, working with a team, yeah. cultural fit, um, look, read up about the company, look at the recent news articles. Like those are the things that the other like cross team might be interviewing on. So you want to be able, make sure you can speak to those things. You know how to work with those functions, you know what those functions do, um, and you know a little bit about the company, so you can answer questions about, about product strategy and things like that. Yeah, and I would just say that what Avantika said is probably more important for a junior role than like a mm -hmm. senior role. So when someone interviews you for a junior position, they're gonna realize that you're not gonna do as well in the same series of questions, or they're gonna give you less difficult questions. Like, don't be afraid that you're gonna get everything wrong and that you failed the interview. It's not about getting all the answers in the interview process. It's about how you work. It's working in conjunction yes. with your interviewer to come up with a solution to the problem. Sometimes they'll give you really difficult problems that they know you won't be able to solve just to see how you react to that. 
and just to like see if you're helping, like how they're going to help you, how you ask for help, how you take feedback. Um, it's not always about having a right or wrong answer. And most of them don't have right or wrong answers. Most of them have many different ways to solve it. Um, and even if you are stuck with a blank wall and can't figure out what to do, you know, talk it through with your interviewer. That's, that's really the key. It's not about like having it right off the top of your head, especially when you're in your first like couple of jobs right out of school. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, we have another question from Abigail, who has also recently received the scholarship. Yay, Learning. Yeah, Abigail. And um, <laughs> in addition to commenting that you both have great hair, oh, <laughs> yeah. she's, she's it's, uh, it's, it's a Birchbox, Birchbox.com <laughs> product. <laughs> she's also wondering um, if there, if you have any tips on staying positive and focused while you're learning, especially when things get tough. Ooh. Oh, that's a really good one. That is a good one. Um, I think what I – I have, like, a guilty secret. Although uh -oh. um, <laughs> I, 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 I have this, like, treasure trove of emails that I save. Like, whenever I get a, like, nice note from somebody or if, like, from old jobs, if, like, somebody sent me a really good note of appreciation, like, this is – totally just like a tip and kind of a secret but I have this list of emails and it's always a great like pick me up if I'm having a bad day especially starting a new job where you feel like you're you're not yet up to like 100 percent you're not yet up to speed like reminding yourself that you're competent and Birchbox is this great thing we call appreciation day where yeah. everyone at the company writes notes of appreciation to each other and and I keep all of those notes me so too. on good days I say like general feedback is keep in mind all the things you've done right, whether it's in the current job or in the previous job or things that got you up to this point. Like there's a reason this company hired you. Remind yourself of that and keep yourself going because every company expects that there's going to be a ramp up period. No one expects you to be perfect from day one. Um, so it's really about you just making sure that you have what it takes to stick it out through the tough part, which is usually the first six months. Yeah. I, so I do the same thing. Really? It's so funny. I save all of my thank you notes yes. for Appreciation Day. And then I read, like, I pick one out at random. So I don't read them when I first get them. Yeah. And then I open them randomly <laughs> when I've had, like, a bad day. And it's always, like, really, so it's good. really, like, a total mood booster. Yeah. Um, also, I would say, like, having a, like, taking a step back, especially when you're, like, so deep into something and you feel pressured. Um, cause you're just like, I need to get this done. I have this assignment due, or my boss wants this fixed in the next like day and I'm freaking out and I don't know how to fix it. Like I've had those moments or I've had those moments where something's broken and we're, we're like, you know, the company that I'm working for at the time is like losing thousands of dollars because like, I don't know how, like what's going on. And like, they're depending on me and you can get really stressed out really quickly. And so like, it's generally one of the things that I do is just take a moment take a step back, walk to the kitchen, get a soda, <laughs> try not to eat too much junk food, right? Because you will start eating candy if you get stressed out. Um, and then just like, remember like who you are, the things that you've done in the past that are great and know that you're going to solve this and you're going to get through it. And then just try to like take a step back and think about different ways that what could be going wrong. Also, you know, talking it through with a friend really helps. Yeah. Um, that's why PR programming is so popular is because you have someone else to talk your problems through. So even if you don't do pair programming, just turning to a friend and saying like, this is what I'm working on. I can't figure out why this is broken. It really helps you. And, and sometimes like you don't even need someone actually there. A lot of engineers will like talk to the wall. <laughs> I've seen it before because really you just need to talk out loud and like then you'll figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's basically just having more clarity and, like, more focus about, like, a high level as opposed to, like, just being so, like, detailed and, like, focusing on this one issue that's bothering you. Yeah, we had another good one, which Ooh. is what are the major differences between being a developer and being a product pro project manager, product manager? Um, how do you know if you want to be a developer or a product manager? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you want to start? Sure. Um... So I consider this a lot, actually. When I graduated, I I could have gone into an engineering field. I could have gone into a product field because I told I, I was in a dual degree program. So um, I had the luxury of being able to choose. Um, I think for me, I really gravitated towards product because I like the balance of skills. Like for me, I felt like if I were you know, just focus on this one aspect of the product development, which is the, the coding and the engineering piece of it, super interesting work. But I felt like I really love thinking through the strategic implications of the problem. I really love 
like working with cross-functional stakeholders and understanding requirements. I um, really loved analytics, like a very analytical person. I wanted to be measuring the results. I really like, like that balance of skills. And so I felt like I enjoyed that. Whereas I have a lot of friends, same program, same background as me, didn't want to do all that other stuff. They found that stuff really boring and they, they like love the technical aspect of the problem. They, they wanted to solve it. They were like core problem solvers at heart and they didn't want to get bogged down with like stakeholder management and other things like that and writing requ lengthy requirements and documentation. And, and they felt like that was really what their passion was. So, I mean, two different paths. I think it's really dependent on what your skills are, what your interests are and, and maybe even talking to people in both fields. I think getting a sense of the day to day can also yeah. oftentimes help understand what the jobs are really like. And also I think that sometimes it's not as clear cut. I mean, it depends really on what company you're working for, but like Avantika does a lot of very technical developer type skills. Like she can program and a lot of our product managers can program and do program for us. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of engineers do help with product as well. So don't think that just because yes. you're going either product management or developing or engineering doesn't mean that you're not going to have like exposure to the product side or as a product manager, you're never going to be able to code again. Like that generally isn't the case. They prefer people who are well-rounded and have all of the combination yeah, totally. skills. Cool. So we have a bunch of people in the webinar who are um, thinking about making a, a total career change, okay. and they love your advice on how um, how to sort of frame their past experiences as they're moving into um, a developer role or wanting to pursue a career in tech, um, maybe from what you've seen interviewing candidates um, and all that. Yeah. So I think we talked a little bit about this briefly when we were talking about interviewing. Um, one of the things that you could definitely use is just talking about your problem solving skills, culture fits, some of the things that Avantika touched on earlier, like having past experience, even though it's not technical, like it still has many aspects of what engineering is all about. Like engineering is a team sport, basically. You're not going to code anything great by yourself or it's going to take you way too long. So you need to know how to play nicely, how to work well with people. You need to have excellent problem solving skills. So I would look at what you've been doing for the past however many years of your career and like figure out like what are those kinds of skill sets that like you gained and like honed while working in a different career and like how that can apply to tech. Yeah. And I would also say that don't let the fact that you don't have career experience in a field mean that you don't have experience in the field. So for me, I, I had, like Birchbox was one of a few companies who took a chance on, on me as a product manager, given that I didn't have like direct product experience. So for me, that was a really big career switch. But um, some of the best advice I got was, that doesn't mean you can't like still build products. Like you're not a product manager, but like I did build products in my free time. I worked on designs for, for an app, for example. I, I mean, I have friends who weren't developers, but they would build stuff in their free time. And that really helps to show that you're interested, you're passionate. Um, but that you also do have experience, even though you didn't work in the field. Um, I think, especially for development, I think if you can show that you have some side projects Absolutely. or you've done a, a few like programs of your own freelancing, freelance work, um, for product management, I would say like think through like problems or sketches of some like cool product idea that you have, um, that shows experience, even if it's not job experience, it's, it's experience and it can definitely help. Um, can you guys elaborate a little bit more on your journeys learning to code? Um, you know, sort of maybe how long it took or how you did it or any <laughs> advice like while well, in the learning process. <laughs> God, I think Becky and I, our paths are like the opposite because I used to code when I was much younger and Becky started later, much later. but continued much longer than I did. Yeah. So this is an Yeah. So I, like I said earlier, I started learning to code in a formal classroom environment. I randomly took a class. I wanted to do something in computers instead of like music and it was the only class open. So that's what I got into. And they basically taught us what to do, how, like what syntax was, like what a for loop is, like when you use a semicolon, if you're using a language, like basically from scratch. And then I enrolled full time in the like computer science program. And so I started basically CSS 101, CompSci 102, etc. all the way through until like I had my major. So it's a very traditional kind of um, college experience where I didn't really teach myself to program. I learned while going to college and had to like learn that while I was there. Yeah. So for me, um, both my parents were in technology. My uh, mom was in a sort of CTO role at like an airport 
which was really interesting. Um, my dad was uh, like founded his own company, but it was a technology company. He was he was an engineer, so had a lot of that growing up, a lot of pressure to get into the technology field. Thankfully, I liked it. Um, so even in high school, I, I took a lot of computer science classes. I you know I really enjoyed it. I I would build stuff in my free time, and I knew that that was something I wanted to pursue going to college as well. So that was my major in college as well, in computer science engineering. Really enjoyed most of the classes there. But again, as I said, it felt like I wanted to do something in a slightly different field as well to round out my experience and skill set. So um, I think in my past few jobs, my the coding, the actual development I've done has been less, I'd say. Like I was in, in data science analytics, which requires a little bit of SQL, which is not really development, I would say. Um, and my current role oftentimes involves looking at code and understanding code, but not so much writing code. Um, that said, the experience is very handy as a product manager. I think yeah. um, having a product manager that understands technology and, and programming well is unique and very valued. So that was my path. <laughs> kind of piggybacking off of that, do you guys have a favorite programming language or one that you're most excited about at the moment? <laughs> do I have a favorite programming language? I feel like that's asking me if I have a favorite pet. Um, <laughs> No, I don't have a favorite programming <laughs> language. I'm pretty much language agnostic. I like picking my languages by what tool I'm doing, what job needs to be done. Um, you know, if it's something that needs to be super performant, I'll pick a certain language. If it's something that I need to code fast, maybe I'll do Ruby with Rails to like generate half my code for me. If I want it to have a really cool like slick UI, maybe it's some kind of JavaScript with like React.js. It really just varies on what I'm doing at the time. There are definitely programming languages I don't like, um, but the others I pretty much like evenly. <laughs> so, uh, well, Becky can definitely answer this question better than I can, so I'm glad she started. Uh, when I was in college, Python was all the rage, so that was the last one I remember really programming in, and I liked it. Um, but more recently, actually, and given that I work on the mobile apps a lot, I've been thinking about taking classes in Swift. And it's not, it's not a programming language in itself, but it is a framework that helps you build apps very easily, very quickly, you can get up to speed within a, like a month or even less if you take the right classes. Um, so I think that's a good one if you're even thinking about teaching yourself or side project to build a little app on your own. Uh, Swift is easy to pick up and like for people like me who know the basics but haven't done it in a while, I think I'm gravitating towards. Mm -hmm. Becky, follow-up question. Sure. For <laughs> those of our audience who are completely new and haven't written a line of code before, do okay. you have a suggestion for a good first language to learn? Yeah, I would say a good first language to learn is probably anything that's an interpreted language. So if you don't know, there are different types of languages. Interpreted languages mean they don't have to be compiled. So Java is a compiled language. It means that you generally have to turn all of the code down to like C and like compile it down to bytecode. So that's not super great for your first language is it's a, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I would say probably Ruby's a good one. So I know that Flatiron School teaches Ruby. That's pretty excellent. The community is very, very active. Um, Python, another great one to start with. Um, if you want to get like really serious into like enterprise level like java is generally considered like the standard for certain things some most engineering schools teach all the fundamentals in java um go is a fun new language to play around with i really like that one but yeah i would start with the interpretive languages because they're really easy and you can tell immediately like whether or not something's broken without having to like mess around with like an ide which can be really really intimidating when you first start programming I know I did. I was freaked out when I first looked at an ID. I was like, I don't know what this is. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we actually have another scholarship winner. With oh, my goodness. Exciting. Great. Um, Congratulations. So this is from Dalma. Um, she asks um, what advice you might have for someone who has landed their first junior developer role, um, just how they can do the best work that they can and how to get the most out of that experience. Okay. Do you want to go? Sure. Um, let me think. Uh, I think getting to know, I mean, the basics when you start out, like getting to know the code, getting to know the team. Um, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I don't have this personal experience in this area, but I can tell you that for a lot of junior developers that I've seen start on the team, some of the most successful ones spent their entire first two weeks just like 
talking to almost every engineer in the team, learning what they know, like learning the pitfalls of certain areas of the code, understanding how everything is built out. Um, look wider than just the tech team too, I would say, like talk to your product managers, get a good relationship going with them, understand what their priorities are. Um, if, you, if you're interested, talk to other parts of the company too. I think that helps you just keep the bigger picture in mind, even though you might be working on a very specific part of the problem. Um, understanding what's going on in the company, the landscape is always a good thing. Uh, I guess those are like basics. Yeah, and then don't obviously. be afraid to ask for help. Uh, I tend to see a lot of new engineers who come so, in and they're, they're ashamed or they don't want anyone to know that they're struggling because they think this issue is probably really easy and obviously a senior engineer could do this. and. I don't want to bother them because they'll probably be annoyed with you. But the thing is that as a senior engineer, we were all there. At one point, I was the neediest, <laughs> loudmouth, like probably annoying engineer ever. And it really helped my career. So go for it. We are well aware that like it's expected. Like um, tech is a really great community and that we, we mentor everyone who's more junior than all of us. So it's something that's really instilled in most engineers to help out people who are at different stages of their career who are younger. And just ask for help because it could take you hours. And the next person, you'll just be like, oh, let me, you know, can you help me look at this? And they'll be like, you're missing this right here. And then you'll just be like, oh, so like, I didn't really see that. I can't believe I missed it. Like you'll have it in an instant. And then, um, but the caveat to that is to make sure to know when to ask for help versus when not to. If you can Google it, that is generally a good sign. Um, so you usually start by teaching juniors to ask for help and then you start training them when to ask for help. So people only get really annoyed with junior engineers when they've asked questions that they could easily have asked Google. So at least spend, you know, time box it, try to spend like 30 minutes maybe max or an hour, depending on what the bug is, um, by yourself and show that you have done some work instead of bothering someone every five minutes. But go ahead. If you've spent that time, if you've done some Googling, go mm -hmm. for it. Ask. Yeah. And on that note, I think mentorship is a really good point. Like find a buddy, find somebody that you get coffee with every now and then. Like as Becky said, there are going to be those moments where you're going to be having a really bad day. You're going to need somebody to talk to. But also even senior mentors, I would say like, people like Becky and people like in slightly more senior oh roles, <laughs> like you, you can, you can approach them. Don't be intimidated by them. Like get to know them a little bit better, like get comfortable talking to them. I think as we said before, like mentorship and, and having good role models is a really big part of do, being successful in tech. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. Awesome. Um, can you guys talk for a minute about some of the misconceptions that you maybe had about going into tech or maybe you feel that other women have um, and sort of like how and when you saw the light and just kind of bringing that topic mm. up, to, up to the conversation? Yeah, I think I the big one that I had, I, I feel like I'm I, sorry for repeating myself, but I feel like when I was coming into tech from like a non tech role, um, I felt like. I might not fit in as culturally as much. Like if I don't play video games, I'm not going to like be able to get to know the tech team as much. If I don't like know all the star Wars and star Trek references, I'm going to like not make any friends. And I think this was like the most exciting part about Birchbox was that getting to know our tech team and realizing that they're such diverse people. They're not a stereotype. All engineers are not nerds. They're really cool people. Like you will find things in common with them. You will share interests with them that are not like the stereotypical engineer interests. And I think having that open mind and feeling like, you will like the culture is it was a big one that I was excited about um and as Becky said if, if you find that you are in a culture that you're not feeling as comfortable in or you don't feel as included um you have options so don't let that deter you but I think for me that was a big one yeah joining a tech team like we're talking Definitely. I think that other misconceptions I had was just like one of the questions that you'll see always in outside interviews is, you know, what are you working on right now outside of your current job? Which makes mm -hmm. it seem like everyone <laughs> is just going home at the end of the day doing nothing <laughs> yeah. but programming. Um, and I personally tend to like more well-balanced candidates because it means that they have a life outside of work, which is great. Um, I also tend to think that if you have time to program, then you should probably be programming for your company. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my gut feeling. But I do think it's also important to have some fun side projects too. But I think that that question is a little bit, 
arrogant, especially when you're coming from a like non-traditional background. So if you're working full time right now at a different career, and you're trying to make the switch, having someone say to you, well, what other programming do you do outside of your current job? Like that can be really difficult to justify because, you know, maybe you have a kid or you have like two jobs you're trying to like make rent. Um, and so that always I found was like really intimidating. So I would say like try to devote some time to a fun side project and then just sell that. Um, you know, you should definitely be like allowed to program outside of work. Take your time, do what you want to do. It's fun. I love programming. I do work outside of work. I guess that makes no sense, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, it's definitely one of those things that really turned me off in the beginning. So. Um, actually, kind of on that note, um, we had a question a little uh, or a little bit earlier about work life balance and yeah. sort of how you how you balance that day to day. Um, and also curious, what are some of the ways that you stay involved with the programming community outside of your work? Yeah. Sure. So um, I am a member of a lot of tech organizations throughout the city. I also, most of my friends are in tech, which is really weird, but like I, I go to like dinner parties and birthday parties and it's just full of tech people. And so I end up talking about tech with those people as well. Um, so that's one way to stay involved in the community. I also believe in giving back. So I, I personally have a mentor and I also am a mentor to several people as well. So there's that kind of thing that I do to stay involved in the community. I also make sure I take time to like read the latest stuff that's coming up to study the things that need to be studied and continually to learn. Like I said earlier, staying current is really key in a technology role. Um, and then what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, it was work life balance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So work life balance, it's always going to be a challenge in tech. Um, I think it's a challenge anywhere these days. Yeah. Um, there will be times when your project is launching and you have three weeks left and everything is broken. Uh, and so I call those, those are called like crunch time. And during crunch time, I firmly believe in putting all hours in and going, you know, full throttle to make sure that my project gets done, that everything is well. And like during launch time, that's very critical. Any other time, I want to make sure that I have a sustainable work-life balance because you will get burnt out if you continually operate in a crunch time mode. So I try to make sure that I, you know, finish work at the end of the day at a certain time. I have sometimes go on vacation and don't answer any of my emails or look at all. I have a lot of like time where I don't look at my work emails because I know that like that time is sacred. That's the time that I need to just chill out, let my brain reset and then come to work eager to start again. Yeah, and the work-life balance question is, I, I feel really excited. Like this is one of the things that excites me most about our industry, actually the tech industry. It's um, I've come from like consulting companies and like other yeah. companies where it's like a nine to, nine to seven background or like there are hours and you have to be working during those hours. And my favorite part about working in tech is that there are no hours, like you have things you need to get done. If th that takes, nine to however late it takes you you get it done if that if you can do it later or if they were having a light day you can work from home or you can like take a shorter day but I think the flexibility is amazing and the fact that you can work remotely the fact that you can um, like travel and work like a day from somewhere else like I think that's the flexibility is great and especially like we've got so many new moms in the office we've got a lot of like pet owners who have like commitments places they need to be they can work like until a certain hour of the day, they can go home, take a break, and then they can pick it back up at home if, they, if they're having a long day. Yeah. So that flexibility is just amazing. I, I just think like the idea of like being in an office or a desk job for, for FaceTime or just having to be yeah. there because of the hours used to frustrate me to no end. Um, but now I feel like when I'm working, I'm giving 100%. I'm here. I'm getting my stuff done. But if I'm done, I'm done. And you know, it's great. It's all about just getting the work you have done. It's not so much about the hours. Absolutely. I mean, I think I tell all of my direct reports, I don't care what time you come in. I don't care what time you leave. Um, there are certain meetings that you are required to attend. So if you're not in the office, you need to call into those meetings. But other than that, all I care about at the end of the day is that you do your job. Yeah. Um, and that's really the only metric that counts. I would never want to work in an environment where I was told I had to be in the office by 8 a.m. Yeah, because I am not a morning person, <laughs> and um, I, I don't expect my engineers to have to do that either. So if I have to be here at eight a.m. for a meeting, I will be. But other than that, I'm not coming in at eight a.m. And so long as I get the work done, no one has a problem with that. Great. Yeah. Um. So I think a lot of people have a perception of the tech industry as really young. Mm -hmm. Um. And a question we get a lot is, do you have any advice for people who are maybe a little bit older, maybe over the age of forty, who are trying to have a career change and, and pivot into tech? So do you have any advice for people like that? 
I think it's somewhat similar to if you're making a career change. It's how your experience that you have developed over the like the past years that you've been active, how that translates into like a tech role. So if I was a manager of a retail store until I was 45 and then I transferred to tech, like you gained valuable skills working in retail. You know how to manage employees, you know how to, you know, manage inventory, you probably know how to do some amazing data analysis. Like those are all skills that are actually very beneficial in tech. Um, and you know, I do think that there definitely is a lot of young people in tech and sometimes that's not for the better. Um, you end up with managers who are very young, who don't know what they're doing and they have a very hard time mentoring their direct reports because no one's really mentoring them. So I think having other people who are older would actually benefit the tech community as a whole. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, um, I like to think of it as it's not so much about age. It's if you're young or old, it's like about applicable experience. So if you have, a lot of experience, even if it's not directly in product or tech, if there's ways that it can like help you in your job, it's, it's, it's an asset. Um, I think the one thing that people struggle with is if you have like 10 or 15 years of experience expecting to come into a role that you're like new at and at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the same level that yeah. you were at, that's probably not going to happen because again, it's about like regardless of your age, what level you're at based on the skills you've acquired so far. So for me, I, I didn't have as much specific product experience. So I had to start almost from the bottom again, which is fine because I wanted to build up that skill set. I wanted to learn the basics. So it doesn't matter if you have number of years, it's just the skills you have and the experiences you've acquired. So as long as you have that expectation and you are willing to start from whatever level is right for you, um, I think it shouldn't matter. Agree. Okay. Yeah. Um, so earlier in the conversation, um, you mentioned that as a developer, as someone who works in tech, you're always learning. Do you have any favorite websites or blogs that you use to stay current? Yes. Oh, my goodness. So I use a blog platform that actually is a blog aggregator and then provides me all kinds of interesting tech articles. Um, I think it's called blog love it. I'd have to look at what the, like, yeah, it's blog love it. And you can like subscribe to all the things that are coming out. I also subscribe to a newsletter that does a lot of new cutting edge tech. Um, I get that daily, I think it's called like PS express or something. I don't know. That's Photoshop express. Um, <laughs> it's PS daily or something. I'd have to look it up. Um, so I get a lot of interesting blogs like curated and sent to me, mm -hmm. um, specifically about things that I care about. So retail technology, subscription technology, um, commerce security, different kinds of things like that, that are all happening. Um, yeah. And then just like learning, I would just look at like what's coming up and then I just decide, Oh, I want to, you know, I want to learn more about go. I want to learn how to do this interesting algorithm. Like, you know, what is the technology that's helping run Alexa right now? Like, how can I learn more about that? Yeah. Uh, and same for product. I think, um, I have a similar system. It's not as savvy as a blog aggregator, but it's, uh, it just sign up for a bunch of like news, news, newsletters from product, pe respected product people in the field who aggregate product articles and the top ones every week. So I think product hunt does one. There's a really interesting blog called strat chat, 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 I think I'm going to murder the name, but, um, uh, it's a long, it's strat chat, or something like that. And then there's a uh, mind the product. There's like a bunch of these product blogs. Intercom has a great product and design blog. Yeah. Um, so if you just sign up for those newsletters, you'll get them in your inbox. Like when you have a moment, it's always good to read, good read on the subway. Uh, Google alerts. I set a lot of Google alerts, like Becky said, for things like box subscriptions, Birchbox, like just yeah. so that I know what's going on in the news outside of tech, just wanting to know what's going on. Um, always a good idea. Uh, yeah. And then a lot of, a lot of that comes from like your community work too. So with product team, we're always sharing new articles and new cool products that we see, we've sent it out to the group. So you should be also just talking to your colleagues and learning from them. It's always a good place. Great. All right. So we're almost at the top of the hour. So we have time for one last question before right. we wrap up. I know time flies. Yeah, um, that good. was really quick. <laughs> yeah. Great questions. You guys yeah. yeah. Great questions. So Making this um, think. we'll cap off with this one. Um, can you give me your thoughts around how to know when you're ready to dive in and actually become a developer, especially as we have a lot of people thinking about career switches and like really taking, taking the plunge. Um, was there a moment when you realized this path and like, how could you self, kind of self identify that? I mean, I started thinking of myself as a developer as soon as I talked to my professor and she was like, you should really do this. You're great at it. And I think, um, 
probably like three, like a couple of months before that, when I realized that I was spending my free time after doing my assignment, changing the UI of all of my like applications to be like pink and purple. I'm like <laughs> putting in bad, I was, it was really bad design guys. There was like cats and like all kinds <laughs> of random things on it. And I was like, why am I wasting all of my free time doing this? It's because I loved it. And so at that moment I was like, you know, maybe this is what I want to do. Um, and that's probably the moment I started thinking of myself as a developer when I thought it was time to like, you know, go out and get a job. Like that's a different conversation. Like I probably started looking, you know, after college and even during that interview process, I was just like, Oh my goodness, am I ready for this? And you know, I had the same problems that most college students have when they come out of a school, like they, they think they're ready. They're like, I've got this. I know everything I need to know. And then you get there on the job and you're like, no, like no one taught me anything. And so for the first like three months, you're just like, I, I remember just being really mad at my school. Cause I was like, you didn't teach me this. You didn't teach me, you know, we didn't do much of this other stuff that I'm having to do. And I really was just like overwhelmed. And so I think that you know, just because you don't personally feel ready, that doesn't mean anything. You're expected to learn on the job. So it's really more just like start thinking of yourselves as developers now. If you code, you're a developer. End of story, right? Like anyone who codes can be a developer. Um, and it's just about having that faith in yourself. Cool. I, I mean, I, I don't have much to add, but I think the willingness to learn is a huge one because I've definitely worked with developers who maybe have less, less experience and maybe this is their first job, but they were just so interested and passionate and like open to learning that like they came in and day one, they just like asked a lot of questions. They wanted to learn more and they, they get there quicker. So I think as Becky said, don't get intimidated or freaked out. If you feel like you don't have that much experience and you, you know how to code, you're probably ready. Just make sure you're open to learning and learning fast. Yeah. Cause you're never going to have all the answers. Yeah. No matter how senior you are, you're not going to know everything. And it's just really coming to terms with that. Like you're going to go into a new job, 15 years in experience and you're going to be like, I don't know anything. Yeah. And, and that, you have to learn it all over again. And so. that's the thing about tech. I think that like languages keep changing. The frameworks keep changing. There's always a new thing on the horizon. So even if it's not your first job, you're going to have times where you're going to feel like I have to learn this all over again. Yeah. So um, just having that openness to learn. Yeah. Like, and that's really one. like, once you're willing to learn and you're willing to say, I don't know this, but I can figure it out. Like I will learn how to do this. You're pretty much a developer at that point. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you guys. yeah, thank you guys for attending. And as a special thank you for coming to our webinar, um, we have a special offer for you guys. If you join Birchbox, you'll get a free lipstick. So pretty great. Oh. It's a really good lipstick. I've used it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like magical. It's, it looks blue, but it just Is it? lights you up. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah. But thanks so much. Yep. Yeah. I'm just going to pop back in the frame. Thanks for joining, everyone. Um, if you have questions about Flatiron, we're going to send a follow-up email and the Birchbox offer. And we hope to see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.